Today, we host a roundtable discussion on President Obama's final State of the Union. Joining us are five guests, U.S. Senate candidate Congresswoman Donna Edwards of Maryland, public TV broadcaster and author Tavis Smiley. He's editor of the new book, The Covenant with Black America, Ten Years Later. Black Lives Matter co-founder Alicia Garza also joins us, Code, Peak founder, uh, Code Pink founder Medea Benjamin, and immigrants' rights activist and military veteran Claudia Palacios. We welcome you all to Democracy Now! Um, let's begin with one of our guests who were in the House last night, in the Congress, as President Obama delivered his last State of the Union address. Congresswoman Donna Edwards, welcome to Democracy Now! Your thoughts on President Obama's State of the Union? Good morning, Amy. I mean, I think the president really laid out a, a vision for America. I think he dealt with the political reality that not a lot, if anything, will be accomplished uh, over this year, given that it's an election season. But I think he also cautioned us uh, to remember where we started and um, to use that as a, a basis for moving forward to strengthen the economy, to uh, grow jobs for the 21st century, um, and to invest in the American worker. Uh, I heard that message really clearly, and I think that um, his message was for Republicans uh, to stop being so divisive, uh, to stop calling out uh, those of us who share a different faith, a different race, a different um, uh, background. And I think that that was an important and optimistic message for a united America. And, Congresswoman, in terms of uh, the president being able to assert his accomplishments or his legacy, uh, that uh, this was billed as a speech that would do that, how, do, how successful do you think he was in that sense? Well, I think the president was very clear in talking about the importance of an Affordable Care Act that's delivered health care to 18 million people. I think that he was really clear about seven years of economic growth, not you know, the kind of growth that we need to see overall in the economy for working people who've had uh, stagnant wages, but we're not losing 700,000 jobs uh, every month. Um, I think he pointed to an auto industry that Republicans, frankly, would have let failed and that we revived as Democrats. And so I think that he was really clear about laying out what he accomplished, um, but also putting forward a vision uh, for the United States that is not one that's going to be achieved in his presidency, but one that we should aspire to. Alicia Garza, um, you are not used to being on the inside. You're usually on the outside protesting in the streets, co-founder of Black Lives Matter. Yet, last night, you were invited into uh, the inner sanctum. You were there for the address, invited by Congressmember Barbara Lee. Um, your thoughts, not only on the speech, uh, but this isn't his first speech. It's President Obama's last State of the Union. And so it must be compared against his record. Mm -hmm. I mean, first and foremost, it was such an honor to be a guest of such an incredible uh, visionary for uh, working people, for women. Um, I was so glad and honored to be there as the guest of Congresswoman Barbara Lee. Uh, the, the thing that I think was glaringly missing from the conversation last night uh, was really the conversation around not just gun violence broadly, although that is a major issue in our country, but police violence as it relates to black communities. And as I was sitting there last night, I couldn't help but think about Samaria Rice, and I couldn't help but think about all the mothers who have lost their children, not just to gun violence broadly, but to the very people who are supposed to protect and serve us. And so, to be quite frank, I think uh, this message that President Obama came in with eight years ago around hope and change uh, is a message that I think people are still looking for, how are we going to accomplish that? And ultimately, I think last night's speech was definitely a vision for where uh, we think the country can go. But certainly, I think that many people who have been involved in this movement uh, certainly wanted to hear President Obama, the possibly the last black president um, in our country's history, uh, really talk about what's going on in black communities specifically, really address the question of race, racism and structural uh, racism and structural violence. And then certainly to talk about uh, what kinds of proposals are on the table to ensure that black people can live full lives in this country like everyone else. And following in that vein, I'd like to ask Tavis Smiley, who's here in our studio, uh, there were a lot 
lot of things that were not mentioned, including the, the president's failure really to end the wars in Afghanistan mm -hmm. and Iraq. But what, this whole issue of how he, he missed the opportunity to really make a final statement on the situation in black America. Yeah. I think, first of all, the president into history is going to be regarded and treated much more kindly. Uh, then than he is now. Uh, that's number one. He did get some things accomplished, and we ought to give him credit for the things that he did do. Having said that, I think what the historians want, and Amy, are going to have a very difficult time, is trying to juxtapose how, in the era of the first black president, and to Alicia's point, maybe the last black president, uh, but how, in the era of Barack Obama, did the bottom fall out of black America? What this book, The Covenant, 10 years later, underscores, Amy, is that we black America, have lost ground, and it pains me to say this, we've lost ground in every major economic category over the last decade, not one, two, or three, one, but in every major economic category, black folk have lost ground over the last 10 years. Surely these issues existed before he arrived, but we didn't make any ground. We didn't cover any ground. And how do we redeem the time after he's gone? And so that's the part that I think that Alicia is, is raising, sp with specific regard to police brutality and police misconduct. But there are so many other issues, as I, as I mentioned a moment ago, where we just lost ground for the last 10 years. And I think, again, the historians are going to have an interesting time trying to juxtapose those two realities. Hmm. Um, <clears throat> Claudia Palacios, uh, you were arrested on Friday um, in the streets of New York, outside of ICE, Immigration Customs Enforcement, protesting the, the dawn of 2016. With that came these massive new uh, raids, uh, uh, rounding up women, children, um, men, uh, to deport them. Talk about your own experience. You're a Marine. You're a military veteran. I mean, good morning, Amy. First of all, we have to understand that there hasn't been an increase in deportations or raids. Annually, it's been an average of 200,000 uh, deported migrants from the United States, though it's this um, it's a spectacle that was created by the mainstream media. In June of 2014, there was images that were leaked um, of inhumane detention centers which allowed for the expansion of detention centers and an increase in law enforcement. And that, that was part of our demands as protesters on Friday, is that we need ICE out of these communities. We need to stop criminalizing people of color. And, I mean, the, as, as a group of activists, we, we understand that we are part of the mass of the anti-incarceration movement because that is what is destroying our families, not only in the black communities, but in the migrant communities uh, comprised of brown, black people from all over the world, refugees. So these nonprofit industries are, are, are literally profiting off of creating situations in other countries where we're forced to migrate and we're displaced. And then we come to this country and we're pushed, funneled into different industrial complexes, have it be, as myself, the military industrial complex or the prison industrial complex. And, and yet they, the president had one of the uh, leaders of the Dreamers movement sitting up in the gallery next to Mich uh, Michelle Obama. And, but his, uh, the actual speech had very little reference, other than say we have to fix our broken immigration system, little reference to his own re record or legacy in terms of immigration. Right. I mean, I think it's a, it's, it's a mockery to have him be um, a guest, an honor guest at the State of the Union, and then have no not even initiate the conversation of immigration and how we are going to uh, deal with this or how we're going to create sanctuaries for people that are being targeted. And we're talking about women and children. We're not talking about felons over families. Um, and, I mean, that's what, like, as activists, that's why, we, like, we're boots in the ground. We're willing to put our bodies in the line to to send the message across that we, we want ICE out of our communities and also we want our our folks to know, our people at Pueblo to know that, that we are willing to fight, we are willing to be out there and put everything. Which brings us to Medea Benjamin. Um, we weren't sure if we were going to actually have you on the show today, Medea, uh, co-founder of Code Pink, whether you'd be interrupting the State of the Union address last night and maybe be in custody. We weren't sure. You have been known to interrupt President Obama, for example, when he spoke at National Defense University, laying out his drone program. You wrote a book on drones, protesting the people who've been killed by drones. What was your assessment of President Obama's last State of the Union address? Well, first, I think it's important to recognize the historic foreign policy accomplishments in terms of Cuba and Iran. 
And I think it is so important that he countered the Islamophobia that is rising in this country. But his policies have really not been kind to Muslims around the world. He's authorized the largest weapons sales to Saudi Arabia ever in history, $46 billion during his term. This is being used not only to repress people inside Saudi Arabia, but to kill people in Yemen. He has increased the U.S. military aid to the repressive government of Israel. He has opened up the uh, U.S. military uh, cooperation with the repressive Egyptian government. Uh, he has used drone strikes to kill thousands of people in countries where, that we're not even at war with. Uh, and he talked last night about wanting to close Git uh, Guantanamo. And yet he said that for seven years, while he could use his executive power to actually close Guantanamo. I think if he really wanted to help Muslims around the world, the best thing he could have done was to call for an arms embargo to the Middle East. That would have been much more in line with the Martin Luther King call that he used for unarmed truth and unconditional love. Uh, Medea, I wanted to ask you about his uh, his comments on climate change, which I think were some of the most pointed comments uh, that he made uh, in his speech. I think we have a floater where he's talking about uh, the continued denial by many in Congress of uh, climate change. Let's see if we can get that uh, that floater up there. Look, if anybody still wants to dispute the science around climate change, have at it. You will be pretty lonely. Because you'll be debating our military, most of America's business leaders, the majority of the American people, almost the entire scientific community, and 200 nations around the world who agree it's a problem and intend to solve it. But Uh, Medea, that was the president on climate change. Uh, your uh, assessment of his legacy in this area and of, uh, of uh, his challenge to the Congress? Well, there's positive things in that he listened to the grassroots to stop the Keystone Pipeline, uh, that uh, the presence of the U.S. to try to come to some agreements in Paris. And uh, yet, he, his government has continued the subsidies to uh, big oil. He talks about uh, changing the relationship to coal, but keeps supporting it. Uh, and uh, he supports the TPP, the Trans-Pacific Partnership, which would be uh, disastrous for the environment. And then, finally, we should recognize that the U.S. military is the largest polluter in the world and something that continues to grow under the Obama administration. Congress Member Edwards, you won't be able to sp uh, spend the whole hour with us, so I wanted to get your response um, to a few things uh, that were raised so far. On the issue of President Obama and war, um, <clears throat> the drone wars. Uh, can you talk about, as you run for Senate, what is your um, critique and also where do you think uh, he has uh, — how do you assess his policy around, well, <clears throat> he inherited two wars, but he's also extended the longest war in U.S. history in Afghanistan? Well, I mean, I have long uh, said, Amy, thanks for the question. Um, you know, I celebrate President Obama in so many ways on a, a number of issues, um, on issues of the um, increased uh, militarization. Those are issues on which I and um, a handful of members of Congress have disagreed with him on the increased use of a drone strategy. I think it's been very counterproductive to what we need to have happen in civilian communities um, and destroyed uh, relationships with, with uh, families and communities, people that we actually need uh, if we're going to have a, a stronger um, vision for peace um, in some of those uh, very difficult regions. Um, and, and I think the president was right last night in saying that if we, if we want to um, decide as a nation that we're going to go forward um, in this area of uh, military expansion, then Congress has a responsibility, too, uh, to provide for a current authorization for the use of military force. Now, I'm not saying that I would agree with that kind of authorization, but I think it is ridiculous uh, to continue military operations absent um, a new authorization or an updated uh, authorization. I think the president has said that several times, and he put it back at the feet of the Congress again. I think it's high time that we had that debate um, in the Congress of the United States. And I'm actually convinced uh, that if we have a thorough uh, debate, then the grassroots around this country are going to speak up 
um, and say that there has to be a limit in, in terms of what the United States and the role that the United States ought to play from a military perspective uh, around the world. Um, and so were those things uh, that was missing? Yes, but the call uh, to Congress to, uh, to act when it comes to uh, authorizing the use of military force with respect to ISIS, ISIL. Um, I think that that's important. And we can't continue to uh, run military operations, significant military operations, off of an authorization that's, you know, the better part of 15 years, uh, 10 to 15 years old now. Uh, um, I, Michelle Obama sat next to an empty seat last night, um, that seat symbolizing the thousands of people who are missing in this country, killed because of gun violence. Could that seat have also represented the number of people who have been deported, even some of President Obama's closest allies in the Latino community and Latino organizations have called him the deporter-in-chief? Well, I mean, I, I don't think it's my job as a member of Congress to uh, call the president names. But what I will say is that last week I called out the president's policies uh, when it comes to uh, to deportation um, and this sort of extreme enforcement in communities that uh, in the congressional district that I represent is um, causing so much great fear in communities, children not going to school, people not going to work, being afraid uh, to be seen and, and, and visible in their communities. And I think it's irresponsible. In fact, I, I just last week had a, a, a pretty heated conversation with uh, ICE officials about their enforcement activities in my congressional district and across the country. Um, and, you know, look, there is another, another place where uh, the, the, um, the administration has discretion, and it can use that discretion um, to leave in peace uh, families. Um, you know, go after felons, go after uh, lawbreakers, but leave families alone. And in the absence of this Republican Congress refusing uh, to engage in a, a serious way on comprehensive immigration reform, I don't think it is the responsibility of the administration uh, to cover that up by deporting families. So what did I tell you? I, I, I couldn't hear you. I'm sorry. What did I tell you? You said you had a heated interaction with them. How do they explain? Um, as President Obama says Congress is stopping comprehensive immigration reform, he's not stopping. He's not reforming, but he is actually moving forward in acceleration we haven't seen before. I don't think that there is. I mean, I don't think that there is a, a response, frankly, that ICE can give now. I think their enforcement, uh, the enforcement that they're engaged in now is unacceptable. I've joined on with a letter with over 100 members of Congress to the administration uh, to stop these, uh, these deportations, these enforcement actions. Now, some people have described them as raids. I think that they're pretty uh, routine enforcement actions. The problem is that the, um, that the um, administration has discretion when it comes to making a decision about whether to engage in this heightened level of enforcement or not, and they are taking that um, that action to the uh, to the extreme. And so, um, I hope that uh, the the administration, the president, are going to hear what we're calling uh, calling for as as members of Congress to stop uh, this kind of heightened enforcement in our our communities and stop putting the fear. Um, into families and, and, and children afraid to go to school, uh, people afraid to go to church um, because they're afraid of these enforcement actions. Congressmember Edwards, want to thank you for being with us. Congressmember Edwards is running for the U.S. Senate from the state of Maryland. Uh, we will continue with our other guest, Tavis Smiley, author of The Covenant with Black America, 10 Years Later, uh, PBS broadcaster, uh, radio and television. Alicia Garza will continue with us, the co-founder of Black Lives Matter. Uh, she attended Obama's State of the Union address last night as uh, Congressmember Barbara Lee's guest. We're also joined by Code Pink co-founder um, Medea Benjamin. And we're joined, as well, by uh, Claudia Palacios, who is a military veteran and a migrant justice activist, just arrested on Friday trying to stop the ICE raids. Stay with us.